So today we're going to begin from line 34. I remember it because the last thing we talked about was jinns. Does anyone remember? Yeah. Where he, he says, Aslam um, jinnu nasibina wa'adhu fa'alima. And we talked about the story of the jinn, how they embraced Islam, how they went back to their people and started warning them and guiding them to Islam. So we'll begin from line 34. Before we do that, he's going to read the Arabic for us. He has a written English. Tell us. Let's read from line 34 until 35. Summa la sauda ta amza akhada. Fi ramza na summa ka na baada. Akhdub na tis saddiqi fi shawad. Wa baada khamsina wa amin taab. Tayyib. What does English say? Thereafter, he married Sauda and Ramadan, followed by his marriage to the daughter of the Siddiq Shawad at the age of 51. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he has now returned back to Mecca. Last time, we talked about the jinns of Nasibin. They came to him while he was in the desert. After going to at taif and returning back from at taif he was able to enter Mecca after the protection of one of the tribe tribal leaders. So the Prophet is back, he's inside of his house. He's unmarried at the moment because Khadija anha passes away before he goes to Al-Ta'if when he was 50 years old. Now, in between him returning and in this year, he gets offered an opportunity to get married. So somebody comes to him, Khawla anha, she comes to the Prophet and she says, you know, you should get married. You need to get married. So the Prophet وسلم, says, Who am I going to marry? Then she says, Marry someone that is old in age and also young in age. So then he asks her, Who do you have from these two categories? Because in those times, if you tell somebody to get married, it's not what we do today. Today, we tell you to get married, no plan for you after. If they come to you with any type of, you need to get married, or you should get married, or what do you think about this person, and the entire purpose of it is they have somebody ready for you, and you should marry them. Right? And inshallah, we should try to go back to this type of understanding. So the next time you go to a nikah, and there's a young brother or young sister that's next to you. Don't ask them, when are you going to get married if you don't have somebody for them? Because if you can't find it for them, where are they going to find it from? So, the Prophet says, from the older one and the younger one, who do you have? And she mentions two names. She says, from those that have been previously married and are old in age, so death. From those that are young and I have, have not been married before, Aisha radiallahu anha. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I will think about it. Go and ask them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he says this, she first goes to Sauda. And she says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, wants to marry. What do you think? He says, okay. He goes, gathers his family, they go and they propose. And he marries Sauda in the month of Ramadan. In the month of Ramadan, he is 51 years old. She becomes the first wife that he marries after Khadija radiallahu anha. She was previously married. She is older than, um, the, around the same age as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa marries her. And she actually lives a very long life, even after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Aisha radiallahu anha, she says about her, out of all of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa there was no one that was better in akhlaq, there was no one that was better in worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than Sauda. And they have a special relationship with one another 
in that Sauda radiallahu anha later on is going to give up her nights for Aisha radiallahu anha. So that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam will spend two nights with her and only a day with Sauda. The following month, in the month of Shawwal, so Ramadan, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he says, or here it says, ibn al-Siddiqi fi Shawwal. In Shawwal, he marries or he does the aqd, the nikah, with the daughter of a Siddiq, Aisha radiallahu anha. The way that he marries her, Jibril alayhi salam comes to him in his dream and tells him behind this veil there's your wife. In this dunya and in the akhirah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says when he went and he removed the veil, he saw Aisha. And this happened a total of three times. And as we know, the dreams of the Anbiya are what? They are command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're true. Right? From Ibrahim, what does he say? Inni ara fil manami anni adbahuk. That I saw in my dream that I am going to slaughter you. It wasn't just a dream. What does his son Ismail say to him? Ifal ma tu'mar. Do what you have been commanded to do. Carry out the command that has come to you. Even though there's no direct command, but he sees it inside of his dream. So these are the Anbiya. So the Prophet wasallam, he has Khawra go and propose to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq on behalf of the Prophet wasallam, for Aisha. At this time, how old is Aisha? Nine. Nine years old. Six. Six years old. Personally, I don't even want to like really talk about it. But I know that there's been like as believers, the first thing we understand is khalas, this is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We leave it, we accept it. But I know that there's been an you know, this is one of the things that they accuse our Messenger وسلم, of in our times. But just for the benefit of clarifying, let's go a little bit into this marriage. And there are Muslims recently who have started to make a claim that Aisha anha, was older than what she herself says about herself. She says, I got married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the age of six, and the marriage was consummated when I was nine. Okay? And this is a hadith that's found in the Sahih Muslim. And she is telling us her age. But there are people from the Muslims because they have fallen into the pressure of you know, the arguments of the Orientalists and they want to say that she was much older. So they do a lot of running around to get to the point where they say that when she got married to the Prophet وسلم, she was closer to 18. I would accept this if the number was any other number except 18. And let me tell you why. If, if they said she was like 27, I'd be like, Khalas, it's really, it doesn't matter to me, it was 27. But why, after all of the running around that you do, you get somehow to the age that you think they are going to stop saying something about the Prophet? Why does it have to be 18? When herself, she's telling you her age. In those times, the other thing, they used to get married much younger. And they used to also die much younger. Amr ibn al-As, he says, my father is 13 years older than me. His father is 13 years older than him. How old do you think the mother is? She also has to be young. Aisha radiallahu anha herself, she was engaged to somebody else prior to the Prophet. Okay? To them, if they saw this, you know, what the Prophet did, and this is in Mecca, if they saw it as a problem, they would have brought it up because they were already accusing him of things that they knew he was free from. So if this thing was a problem, we wouldn't have to wait until the 1800s for someone to say, hey, 
Why did the Prophet وسلم, marry someone that is six? Our understanding as Muslims is like if we look at age, we only really care about two ages, right? We care about the age, not even, we just care about one actually. We care at what point do you become responsible for the actions that you do, right? And what is that point called? called? When you become balagh, we have, before balagh, you are a child. After you reach this age, what are you? An adult, right? It's not 18, it's not 17. It's the moment you become balagh and your sins and your deeds are going to be recorded for you. From that point on, you have rough left the realm of childhood. We don't have a word in Islam for teenagers. Right? We have, you know, marhalat al-shabab. From the time of you becoming a man or a woman until the age of 40. And then from there on, you have become a sheikh after that. That past 40, it's, you are just waiting for death to come really. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives long life yeah. filled with khayr and obedience. Yeah. So, what we say when it comes to the age of Aisha radiallahu anha, one, this is, this was something that was normal in those times. And even today, the youngest age that a person could get married in America, what age is it? In all of America. 16? 12. 12. There's some states, the lower, like at the time that you can get married, 12. Is there really a difference between 12 and 9? I don't think so. But today, do we tell people to get married at the age of 9? We don't. We don't do that. Because we live in a different time. And marriage itself it is an act that is mubah. Right? It is an act that is permissible. And when things are permissible, this is where you could bring in the cultural rulings. Right? What does our, there are some places in this world where people get married young. Places like here, this wouldn't be normal to us. Right? But if we go back to our country, would it be normal to see kids in finishing middle school getting married? Eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, you know, entering high school to get married? Of course. The age difference between me and my mother, 15 years. Between me and my father, 21 years. I, I am closer to my father in age than to my youngest sibling. Right? So, where they came from, this is my mother getting married at the age of you know, 15. My father being 21, this is, this is normal. Until today, this is normal. But here, it's not. So whenever this question comes up, we say, the age of Aisha radiallahu anha, what she tells us. Because if we reject what she tells us, and you know, like the fact that it isn't Sahih Muslim, what other things can we begin to say, okay, this is not... This is, this is, we have to start rejecting these other things from the most authentic books that we have. For the most authentic book after the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Sayyid Bukhari. Right? We have any questions here? Uh, I have one. Actually, um, I, I watched a khutbah from Omar Suleiman about mm -hmm. um, this issue as well. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, they understand the time old times where ages were a little lower. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger criticism comes from Prophet Muhammad being almost 60 mm -hmm. while she's being 60. And like if, if he was like 20 and he was 10, yeah. that, that's what people look at. Like, okay. like, so the age gap. An old person, with a grandchild, <laughs> and you could even younger than that. I mean, it's again cultural, probably. Yeah. Okay. People understand people all the time. They, they die at 30. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so, so to answer the gap here, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is 50. At what, like, what point would we feel comfortable with the age gap? Like, how big, like, what is a good age gap for us here? That's the, what's the good age gap? Because there is a point where the, it doesn't matter, right? Like, I, I, to me, you know, like, if we look at the celebrities that we have, you would have someone that's like 47 years old be in a relationship with someone that's 18, 19, 20. And this is no problem. For example, we have the Shayateen, the president or the prime minister of France. Right? What's his name? Macron. He married his middle school teacher. How big of an age gap is there in this? Simple math tells us she has to be like when she was teaching in her 30s and he is middle school is what age? 11, 12, 13. There's a very big age gap between them two. Do we see it as a problem? Does anyone bring it up and say hey why is there such a big age gap between you? No, we don't, right? And um, one of the things that was, you know, recently going around is uh, what's his name? Who's that? Who's that actor from uh, Titanic? Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio. What happened to him? What does he do? What does someone make an actual like? We studied his life, found something very interesting about him. How old is he? Do we know? Someone look it up for us. Leonardo DiCaprio. How old is he? He's 45. 45 plus. At what age did he stop dating the woman? What age? What what is what what is the criteria? You have to be younger than 25. Right? When people look at this, is there a big fuss around the age gap? No, it's not an age gap. There's no, no big fuss. So if they come up to us, then you have to be like, you have to have the same standards for all these people, even if we, we accept them. So when they come with that, we're like, really? We look at life, at our, our ages, as children and adults. An adult that's 20 and an adult that's 40, it's the same to us. And it's the same in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even with the gap, these are adults, right? And that's how. Even I mean, in the case, we know about that, that <laughs> just hints go to the case and yeah. Right. yeah, that's what they used to do, right? So even like the fact that, you know, the problem with the age gap, the problem with her age, this is not something that anyone had a problem until the 1800s, yeah. right? And this tells you even the kuffar themselves, they had ample time to come up with this, you know, why did he do this? But they even saw this as be, if, if someone today can get married at the age of 12, that means at any time, someone can be what, how many years older than them? The leaf is alone. This is, this is actually the 23rd, 21st century. We're talking about the 6th century, yeah. Thank you, this is a beautiful insight there. If they, at the arc of the time, they thought that it was a problem, then it was the Prophet who would have brought it up. Yeah. Men and men keep uh -huh. back then. Uh, one additional uh, insight is the spiritual insight where Aisha lived, she was very young, so she lived for a very, very long time mm -hmm. after the Noble Prophet So she was able to transmit his had and his teaching for many generations to come. And that's part of the wisdom is that she was very young. So, when she, when the Prophet ﷺ passes away, she is only 18 years old, or, or no, 9 to 10, she's 18 years old. From that time on, one thing, like really one thing that makes her stand out from the other wives of the Prophet is she and Hafsa, which is just a little bit older than her, they weren't the only ones that would actually question the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The other wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
No questions. Whatever he says is done. He has done it. He's the Prophet. We don't ask questions. Aisha and Hafsa, on the other hand, whatever the Prophet would do, they would ask questions. And why? When you get older, what tends to happen? You have, you know, like, you've lived life, so you understand that you see something, you fully understand it. I don't need it to be explained to me. But when you're young, you tend to have a lot more questions. Like, why is it like this? For example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, on the Day of Judgment, people are going to be resurrected, naked, uncircumcised, barefooted. No one asks the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam anything when it comes to this hadith, except for Aisha. She says, does that mean that people are going to see one another on the Day of Judgment? Because everyone's naked. Here, even when someone has clothing on and someone walks in now, all of us, what are we going to do? We're looking. Especially if they pass by us. If it's just that one glance that we look up at. Because this is human nature, right? And this is why the first glance is not sinful. It's the glances that come after. So on that day of judgment, people being naked, this should be like the focus. But when she asks the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, on that day, everyone is going to be too busy with what's in front of them to worry about one another. Then, we know even in that condition that's going to happen to us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he begins to narrate to the companions the punishments of the Day of Judgment. And he explains it in a way where everyone is being talked about. The believers and the disbelievers. So she asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, didn't Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala say about the believers, فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابَ يَسِيرُ That their accountability, them being held responsible, is going to be made easy. What you are describing is not easy. What did the Prophet Sallallahu say? He said, for everyone, it is going, the beginning is going to be punishment. It's going to be difficult. But then later on, it becomes easier. And these are just a few examples of Aisha radiallahu anha asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And out of all of the wives, out of all of the companions, she is one of the seven people to narrate over a thousand hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She really, out of all of the companions, there's only one other person that comes close to narrating the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from inside of the house is Anas. The only, no one else, and he, he doesn't even do as much as her. Right? So we needed to understand how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was inside of the house. Because from the other companions we get how he is outside of the house. Who's going to tell us how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to spend his nights? What did he use? All of these things. Where, where did they come from? From Aisha radiallahu anha. So out of all of the companions, Ibn Rasuyuti, he says, فَالْمُكْثِرُونَ فِي رِوَايَةِ الْسَلَمْ وَفِي رِوَايَةِ الْأَثَرْ أَبِي هُرَيْرَةٍ ثُمَّ يَلِيهِ بِي عُمَرْ He says from those that were many in narrating from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Abu Hurairah. After him, you have Abdullah ibn Umar. Does anyone know the other five? One we said Aisha. Right? What are the four? What are the four companions of the Prophet? So Abu Hurairah, Abdullah ibn Umar, Aisha. There's four missing. Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas. And this is Abdullah ibn Abbas. And then Anas ibn Malik. Khadim Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Without a doubt. And then Abu Sa'id al Khudri. And then the last one, Jabir ibn Abdullah. So these are really when we look at the ahadith of the Prophet, وسلم, the knowledge that was sent down to us. And these were the people that were at the front of it. Right? And Aisha radiallahu anha, because of how much she would ask the Prophet, وسلم, how much she would observe him, 
to the point where really if you look at open up Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, whatever book of hadith you open up, what you are going to really find is these names being repeated over and over and over. Aisha radiallahu anha and the majority of the things that she would tell us would have to do with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inside. And the companions knew of her status as having this knowledge. So they would go to her to gather hadith, students would go to her after. And this is how her hadith have been. Uh, right, this is just some of the benefits that we get from Aisha radiallahu anha. Does anyone have any questions here? Anyone wants to add anything? Before we move on. So he says, This was at the time that the Prophet was 50 years old. We have finished the first 10 years of the Prophet's life after prophethood. For the next three years, and these are years of limbo for the Prophet. He's in Mecca, also does not want to be in Mecca. He begins looking for a way out from this time. Because he realizes this protection that he's in, eventually one day is going to go away. And the believers can no longer live nor practice their deen the way that they should be able to. So in these years, he's going to look for a way out. Let's read line 36 to 40. Actually, 39. 36 to 39. <laughs> وَبَعْدَ سِنْتَيْ وَخَمْسِينَ أَتَى سَبْعُونَ فِي الْمَوْسِنِ هَذَا سَبَقَ مِنْ تَيْبَةٍ فَبَا يَعُوسُ مَحْجَ مَكَّةَ يَوْمُ السَّنَيْ مِنْ شَحْرِ سَفَرَ طيب أبسي ده إنجلش ده He was taken by night and the salawat were obligated. Five with the reward of fifty and the attempt to be preserved. The first bayah was, was with twelve of the people from Tayyip, has been as has been mentioned. At the age of fifty-two came seventy in the Hajj season. This is confirmed. From Tayyip they pledged allegiance and he later left Mecca on Monday in the month of Safar. So now, the Prophet وسلم, what happens to him is Al-Isra wa Al-Mi'raj takes place here. Al-Isra wa Al-Mi'raj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly tells us in the Quran where it begins and where it ends, right? Subhanahu alladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al-Masjid al-Haram. So it begins in Mecca, Masjid al-Haram, min al-Masjid al-Aqsa, to al-Aqsa. This is the a disra, a night journey. The mi'raj is from there to the heavens and then back down. The Prophet ﷺ, this is one of the blessings that reassures him that even after what he dealt with in the year of sadness, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still his Lord. And this is a gift that was given to him to uplift his soul. A disra wa mi'raj. For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is one of the, if not the, one of the greatest blessings that he was given. Because he gets to actually go and speak with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. In one night, he takes a journey that should have taken him a month. And coming back another month, quickly in a night. Jibril Alayhi Salam comes to him on an animal. What is the name of the animal? Buraqa. What kind of animal is it? Uh, is it a horse? Smaller than a horse. What's another riding animal? Donkey. Bigger than a donkey. A mule. So between a horse and a donkey. A mule. 
Today they tell you it had wings, you know, so on. It had none of those things. But we can say on his heels, on his hind legs, it's possible that there was wings. But this is an animal, regardless, in between these two animals, like the size of a mule. And the way that it would travel is as far as it can see, takes it in one step. Alhamdulillah, with the eyesights that we have, if we didn't have these buildings and we went to somewhere that's clear, we see very far. Like we see very, very far. Especially in the desert, where things are pretty much flat. So wherever it would see, one step would take it there. And then another distance further with the next step. With this, you can travel very fast. So, this Jibril alayhi salam rides this animal with the Prophet. He gets to Baytul Maqdis. He gets to Masjid al Aqsa. And in Masjid al Aqsa, he leads the Anbiya, the messengers, the Prophets, in Salah. And then he is taken up through the heavens, which is the Samawat. How many of them? Seven. And then he goes through Jannah. He gets to Sidrat al Muntaha. After Sidrat al Muntaha, he goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are people that, you know, one, one of the fabrications that come is the conversation that was had here is what we say in Al Tahiyyat. Right? They say this was the conversation that took place. This is falsehood. We don't know the things that him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about. The only thing that we know is he comes down with what? Salah. He's commanded to pray Salah. Another thing that happens is Sidrat al-Muntaha, it is the place that he sees Jibril alayhi salam for the second time in his actual form. In his actual form with how many wings? 600 wings. He had only seen Jibril alayhi salam in this manner once before when the Ayat al-Muddathir was revealed to him and then the second time here and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us Surah Al-Najm and Sidrat al-Muntaha this is a tree in which beneath it you have you know, like, this, is, this is really the end of Jannah and this is the place where Jibril alayhi salam is unable to pass so the Prophet sallam, he comes down from there he passes through Jannah he starts going through the heavens. And in every level of these seven heavens, there are prophets. Who's in the seven? Ibrahim. Ibrahim. He passes by Ibrahim and he gets to the sixth heaven. Who's in the sixth heaven? Musa. Musa what does Musa say to him? What have you been commanded with? You don't get called here except that you are going back to something. What was your command? Prophet 50 prayers. Musa alayhi salam says, go back. I was given less. My people were not able to. Your people are not going to be able to do it. The Prophet goes back. And it gets reduced in half. 25 prayers. He goes back down. Musa says, what was the command? 25. He says, go back. I was commanded with less. And my people were not able to do it. Yours are not going to be able to do it. His people, by the way, they're commanded with two prayers. One in the morning, one in the night. And before this coming down of the Prophet ﷺ back to Mecca, this was the salah that the Muslims used to pray. One in the morning, one in the night. 25, he goes back and it's reduced to the number 15. Go back. He comes back down. It's reduced to 10. Go back. It's reduced to five. Go back. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, I feel shy to go back and ask for more reduction. He says, go back because your people are not going to be able to do it. I was given less and my people are not able to do it. In this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to him or says, a voice comes, you have been commanded with five. The reward of them is going to be 50. The reward will be 50. So in reward, you're doing what was first commanded. But in action, it has been reduced to a 10. Right? 
Fellow 50, five times a day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on Musa for making it easy upon us. Even these five, he was right. These five, Allah, he was right. Because we cannot do it. And if you want to know why we cannot do it, look at our misajids in the five daily prayers. Even in a place like this. You know, one of the like most surreal things to experience, especially as, as, as a khatib, is to go to a masjid for dhuhr time on Friday and dhuhr time any other time. Even worse than this, it is to go to our masajids during the nights of Ramadan, Taraweeh, and come back Fajr time. What ends up happening? The first few days of Ramadan, there is no place in whatever masjid you go to. Of Taraweeh. And this is, this is, there's nothing wrong with this. But our priorities are messed up. Because you come Fajr of that day, what ends up happening? The masjid is back to a few people in the house. A few people praying salah. Right? Why? Because these, these too many. It's very hard for us to pray five. But let's just say, for example, it really stayed at 50. Would we have time to do anything else besides praying? Because logically, we would have to say the same rulings that apply to the five have to apply to the 50. Right? Having wudu, having to pray in jama'ah, praying in jama'ah would be much better. We have to establish our masajids and so on. Out of 24 hours, you won't have time to go to sleep. If we were to divide them evenly throughout the day. Because I think in between, like it's really every 30 minutes you have to pray. Almost, right? 24 hours in a day. 50 prayers means almost every 30 minutes you have to pray salah. Can you imagine your life around? What are you going to do? 30 minutes if you have to pray every 30 minutes. Salah is going to be less, be generous, and say five minutes. You have 25 minutes. What time is there for you to do anything else except worship? And this is really the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where we are being rewarded as if we actually do 50, even though there's just the small deeds that we are being asked to do, even though it's only five. Right? But the reward is as if we're doing this. Again, through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then on top of this, really, the most, you know, the saddest thing is you are like, there's so many Muslims on the Day of Judgment, may Allah protect us from it, that are going to go to the fire. And their characteristics is we used to pray, we used to fast. But even with these, we are going to the fire. May Allah protect us from it. So, uh, he comes back down with these 50 goes back on the same journey back to Mecca. When he gets to Mecca, the next day, in the beginning, this was really the, the best day for the mushrikeen. Because when the Prophet wasallam woke up, he tells them what happened to him last night. And he said, I went on a journey from Mecca to the Muqdis, to the heavens, and back to Mecca. Abu Jahl, he begins, laughing and he doesn't even say anything to him he goes and he finds Abu Bakr al-Siddiq before this his name is still just Abu Bakr al-Siddiq has not been given to him yet he goes and he finds him and he says to him do you know what your companion is saying he said what did he say he said he completed the journey that takes us a month to go and a month to come back last night and that he went to the heavens what was the response of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq? If he said it, that's the truth. If he said it, if, he, if what you are saying is true, that actually happened. And the reasoning he gives is, you are telling me about a journey of the dunya, going from Bayt al muqdis from Mecca to Bayt al muqdis I've already believed that there are things that are coming from the heavens to him. You don't, like, which one sounds would be crazier to believe? 
obviously there's, there's revelation that is coming to him. Because this is from the heavens to the earth. But this journey from one place up, if I already believed in that, I can believe in this. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from there, he says, The one that came with the truth, Prophet and the one that did what? He believed in it. Who was? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq From this time, the title of a siddiq was given to him. The Prophet ﷺ was tested on if he actually went to Beit Muqaddis. Because the, the Quraysh, they were merchants, so they would go and they would travel, so they would know what it looked like. So they said to him, describe it to us, tell us what it looks like. The Prophet ﷺ said, I began to worry. I, he said, then all of a sudden, in front of me, I see Beit Muqaddis. I see Jerusalem, like it's right in front of me. And I could see the bricks that were making up the houses. So he would start describing from what he could see in front of him to the Mushrikeen of Quraysh. And they also had no reason to doubt that this actually happened. On top of that, he told them there's going to be a caravan that is going to reach you in a couple of days. They lost their camel with their water and I was able to, I drank from the water and I took the camel back to where they were. And then when they came back to Mecca, they were asked and they said, yes, this is what happened. We lost our camel, it had our water. Somehow it returned back to us, the water was drunk from, and this camel came back. Camels usually when they get lost, they're lost. There's no coming back. So that is what happens to the Prophet Now let's quickly go over um, the next few lines. So then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the Isra al Mi'raj, he has to look for a way out of Mecca. And what he decides to do for the next three years, the 10th year after prophethood, the 11th year and the 12th year, is Mecca, even in those times, it was known for Hajj. People would come to perform Hajj. So when they would come, you'd have people from all over the Jazeera, the peninsula, coming to perform this Hajj. So, the Prophet ﷺ would go from one group of people, from one town to another town, while you know, they're gathering in their tents in Mina, and you know, wherever they are in Mecca, and he would tell them, take, you know, take me, and you're going to rule this whole place. Everyone, this is the offer that they were given. Every single person, and they would either just right away reject the Prophet ﷺ, or they would come with conditions. Some of them would say, we will protect you from the Arabs, but from the Romans, we can't help you. We will protect you from the Arabs, from the Persians, we can't help you. Because we already have an agreement with them. Come, but you will not be the ruler. Come live in our places. But even before this, the Mushrikeen, what they would do, they would go around, you know, meeting the caravans before they would get close to Mecca. Tell them, hey, we have a crazy person that is going to tell you things, ignore him. To the point where there were some of them that would put like, you know, cotton swabs and then not try to listen to anything the Prophet ﷺ says. Except, in the 10th year, he finds seven people from al aws al Khazraj. Here it's really all Khazraj, six of them, one al aws He finds them and they're from at the time Yathrib. When he finds them, he goes to them. He doesn't have hope because this is a people that for the last thousand years they have been fighting one another. And going into a people that are killing one another already, how they, they're not going to, they hate one another and they're living in the same city. It's going to be very hard for you to actually go and tell them, let me be your leader altogether. So he says he, he didn't have hopes for these seven. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to give this da'wah and go look for a way. So he goes and he begins talking to them. Right away, they were amazed. They told the Prophet ﷺ, next year we're going to come back with more people. Next year we're going to come back with more, next Hajj season. When they come back, this seven turns into twelve. So twelve people come. Now there's a, a, a better mix between the Aws and the Khazraj. Every single one of them 
is what we would call consider the Shabab, young people. And this is who really the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had, had like those that embraced him quickly, they were the, the youngsters. The elders, you know, what do they say? Um, you can't teach a, the old dog what? Any tricks, right? And this is lihtira. Like when someone's older, it's harder for them, to, for you to teach them new things. And this is what he found in Mecca itself. Really the elders, this is our way, this is our life, and this is how it's going to be. People that were young, they were like, okay, you know, this is, we'll give this a shot. These 12 people, they embraced Islam. They embraced Islam. And they said, we're going to come back to you next year with more people. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, there's 12 of them, he sends Mus'ab ibn Umair to go and teach them. And the next year, there's 12, how many come back? 75. Here it says 70, right? But it's 75. 71 men, 4 women. This type of usage of 70 in Arabic, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in the Quran, He says, the Prophet Sallam, if you were to seek forgiveness for them, تدعين الله, 70 times, Allah will not forgive them. Our question would be, what if he asked them for forgiveness 71 times? Would they be forgiven? No. Seven is, this is just a number, but it means forever. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, سَبْعَةُ يُذِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ There are seven types of people that are going to be shaded on the Day of Judgment when there is no shade except the shade of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Is there only seven types or is there more? More. An easier example that we should all understand. How many of us know al Bain al Raise your hand if you heard of this. 40 hadith of al -Nawi. Is there 40 hadith in there? How many hadith are in al 40 hadith of al 42. 42. <laughs> it's 42 hadith. Because 42 doesn't sound as nice as Arba'in. Even though you open any Arba'in, there's no 40 hadith. This is 42 hadith. Right? But saying 40, much better. Saying 70, especially in this rhyme form, much better than saying 75. So these 70, they come. The 12, they took their bay'ah in Aqaba. And that was called bay'ah to Aqaba al And they took the bay'ah, very small. The 70, they come, the Prophet Sallam, this is the 12th year. Every single one of them gives bay'ah. And they tell the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, come to us. One of the other things that they say, this happens night time in Mina. All of them are sleeping, the Quraysh, let us kill them now. Every single one of them is killed. Again, this is what you get with the Shabbat, right? This hastefulness, this you get from the Shabbat. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this is not what I have been commanded. So they don't kill them, even though they're sleeping and they kill them. Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at this time he's not a Muslim. But he still goes with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the first thing he says when he sees these 70 is what? what? Where are the elders? The, the, like, because like there are times where having elders makes things much easier. If you get in like an agreement with someone that is young, there's a higher possibility that they, they can go away from this agreement that you had than someone that would be older. Especially when it comes to like rulish, ruling and so on. So he says, why don't I see any of the elders? Their response was, we've been at war for a thousand years. They've killed each other. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when she talks about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she says, from the mercy that was shown to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the fact that in the thousand year war that the people of Medina were engaged in, at that time the city was called Yathrib, right? That they were engaged in, all of the elders of the clan, they were killed. By this time, the, the, the people that were young, they realized, this is, we can't just keep continuing to kill one another. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, 
واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم أعداء فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمة إخوان like remember the blessing that Allah has given you when you, you, you were enemies before but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought your hearts together and you became brothers to one another this is talking about Al-Aus wal Khazraj after that they give him bay'ah uh, this was a bay'ah bay'ah al-nisa the bay'ah of women that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us uh, he says the conditions were Allah uh, yushrikna billahi shay'a wa la yusrikna wa la yazmina and so on like we'll stay away from the major sins we'll stay away from shirk we won't kill our children and so on there was no agreement of defending the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fighting on his behalf none of these yet so everyone gives this bay'ah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then they go back the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from there he starts commanding the companions to go and make it the first one to make it, Abu Salama, the, the husband of Umm Salama, the brother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from breastfeeding. First one to make it and then few other people make it. In total, the number of people that make hijrah, 40, outside of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, 40. The other Muslims at the time, they're in Medina, not in Medina. Abdul Habasha. The number is very few. So they make a place to Medina. Uh, we'll talk about when they get there. But he uses the word Min Ahli Tayba. This name Tayba has not been given to Medina yet until the Prophet in the ninth year, Tamim al Dawsi, he comes to the Prophet after meeting the Jal. And the Jal says to him, Go to Tayba. Because I'm not able to enter it. So, I mean, he goes to the Prophet, he tells him the story. The Prophet tells him to tell the companions the story. Hadith of Hatim ibn Duqais. And then, when he says, he, the Jal said, I cannot enter Tayba, the Prophet struck the ground and he said, Hadith Tayba. This is Tayba. Medina, this is Tayba. So, that name comes in the ninth year. After the Hijrah of the Prophet the first time he gets there, the city gets changed from Yathrib to Al Medina. Medina to Rasulullah. The only people that use Yathrib after this are the Munafiqeen. Only the Munafiqeen, if you, when we hear Yathrib inside of the Quran, this comes at the tongues of the Munafiqeen. Other than that, the city becomes known as Al Tayyibah. Any questions here? Question like that. So, uh, you mentioned about uh, the uh, for mentioning about the fabrication in the by the Prophet Sallallahu went to uh, Israel and Mayraj. Um, I was also heard that like last two ayat of uh, Surah Baqarah or Abbas are also given uh, during this journey. So, what the Salah and these two ayat? What these two verses. Are, what yeah. So, these two verses, there are some that say the entire Surah was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Right, so not just the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, but from beginning to end, it was given to him. We know either it's one of these two. Either the, the entire Surah or the last two was one of the things that were given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Other than that, uh, still, anyway. Jazakallah khair. Uh, the I have a question about the, the form of the prayer, uh, yeah. of the obligatory prayer. Was that, was that known before the Isra and the Mi'raj, or the physical form also came with the Isra and the Mi'raj? Who can answer this for us? Who can turn? Who was here the first few days of the class? It, it was not for all the rest of the people. It was only the, the Prophet who used to perform uh, the Salah and the Dua. So the in the the Prophet is the one that had like fard salah that he had to pray, and the fard salah that he had to pray and also the companions would pray with him. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He says, "Ya yuhal muzammin, qum al layla illa qalila." Stand and pray during the night. So in that time, in I think in uh, where is it? In the first few lessons, here in the poem he mentions I think. Uh, 
بسم الله So he says, he says line 23, 24. So from in that time, the Prophet was taught how to pray two rakats, the way that we pray them. The only difference between the salah of um, the salah of after Isra uh, al-Mi'raj and the salah before was in the one that was before the reading was not really there. What was there was the, the actions. Going up, going down, ruku' sujood, and so on. Where they would come into prayer and they would talk to each other. Allahu Akbar. They would sneeze. One of them would say, Alhamdulillah. The rest of them would say, Alhamdulillah. So just the actions were there. Afterwards, it became what we know it as today. From here, read this. No salah without fatiha, no salah without wudu, and so on. Jazakumullah khair. This is all the questions that we have. We're a little bit late. We'll make adhan and pray in five minutes. Jazakumullah khair.